Can someone just yeah. unmute? You can hear me. Okay. So um, let, I'm going to um, just review briefly what I covered last week and um, this year when I started on Yehuda. So um, Yehuda, as you know, was the fourth son of Yaakov Avinu. And um, what I asked was why he, among all the Shvatim, was blessed by Yaakov that kings would be his descendants. Yehuda appears in three stories in Bereshit, in the sale of Yosef, the story of Tamar, and the meeting with the Egyptian viceroy, whom Yehuda doesn't know is Yosef Hatzadik. So the question is what we can learn from these stories to understand why Yehuda was Zoha to be the source of the kingly dynasty. Now, last week we discussed the fact that Yosef was a favored son of Yaakov and that he had given the coat of many colors, which, which was a characteristic of royalty as shown by Tamar, the daughter of David HaMelech, who also wore a katonis possum, a coat of many colors. The Shvatim, the other sons of Yaakov, viewed Yosef as an existential threat to them. Until now, their great-grandfather, Avraham Avinu, and their grandfather, Yitzchak Avinu, had had two sons, but only one of them, Yitzchak Avinu in the case of Avraham and Yaakov Avinu in the case of Yitzchak, had been chosen as the spiritual heir apparent. Yaakov Avinu had 12 sons, four of them by Leah Imenu. The Shvatim, the 12 sons, believed that one of Leah's sons um, would be the heir apparent. And Leah's sons, who were also the oldest sons, did not feel that it should be Yosef, the son of Rachel, the favored wife. Moreover, Yosef was the dreamer, the one who told his father and brothers that they would one day bow down to him. The brothers felt that they had to get rid of Yosef, lest he supplant one of them as their father's spiritual ear. They couldn't imagine that each would be the progenitor of the Jewish nation because of their limited, ex their limited experience was such that only one person could hold that role. <clears throat> Excuse me, in the first story, involving Yehuda, the brothers plot to kill Yosef. Ruvain, the eldest of Yaakov's sons, plans to rescue Yosef secretly, possibly to assuage his guilt over his past insults to his father. However, we see that Ruvain is not a decisive person. He's, wish he's wishy-washy and seems insecure. And although he persuades his brothers not to kill Yosef, but instead to throw him into a pit, Yehuda is the one who convinces his brothers to sell Yosef rather than have his blood on their hands should he die in the pit. Yehuda is an actor, an active person. And when Reuben returns to his brothers and sees that Yosef is gone, he wails about where he can go. He wants to know what he should do now. His focus is on himself more than on his lost brother and he shows no signs of leadership. The other brothers come up with a cover-up plan and they bring the coat dipped in goat's blood to Yaakov. They don't even have to lie to their father as Yaakov Avinu draws the conclusion they wanted that Yosef had been killed by a wild beast. Now, immediately after this incident, the Torah interrupts the narrative to discuss the incident between Yehuda and Tamar. We learn that Yehuda went down from his brothers Rashi says that when his brothers saw their father's pain over Yosef's presumed death, they now blamed Yehuda for convincing them to sell him. Perhaps seeing his father's grief, Yehuda himself felt a need to separate from his family. Yehuda leaves his family and he goes down both physically and spiritually. Vayet Yehuda, Yehuda turned away from his brothers and he entered into a business arrangement with an Adulamite man. He ends up marrying the daughter of Shua, a Canaanite man. According to Rashi and the Rambam, the, the man was not a Canaanite, but rather a merchant, though some commentators, including Rabbi Eliezer ben Elijah Ashkenazi, who lived in the 16th century, said Yehuda married a Canaanite woman. He has three sons with her, Er, Onan, and Shelah. Yehuda marries Er to Tamar, whom Rashi identifies as the daughter of Shame, the son of Noah. Ir dies and Yehuda marries his second son, Onan, to her, and Onan also dies. According to Rashi, they both died because they spilled their seed on the ground 
rather than have relations with her because she was so beautiful, they didn't want to mar her beauty by pregnancy. After Onan dies, Yehuda tells Tamar to wait a few minutes until Shalah grows, I'm sorry, to wait a few years until Shalah grows up and then she can marry him. Chazal say that Shalah was only seven years old at the time. We don't know if Yehuda genuinely wanted to wait a bit so he could have more time to instruct Shalah so Shalah would not sin as his brothers had, or if, as Rashi says, he feared that Tamar was a black widow and that if Shalah married her, he too would die and Yehuda would have no sons left. Now, the Torah says that after many days, Yehuda's wife passes away and Yehuda goes up to Timnah to the sheep shearers. We don't know how long a period of time passed, but it was obviously a number of years because it was sufficient for Shalat to be old enough to marry Tamar. And we know that because when Tamar hears that Yehuda, her father-in-law, has gone to Timnah, she goes there as well. So I'm now um, resuming the story and I'm going to screen share. And this shear is based on um, a share that was given by Naima Novetsky in July 2019 um, at Nishmat Seminary. So if we go to, to um, source number six, which is from the Torah, the story of Yehuda and Tamar, if we look at um, Psukkim 14 to 20, is there anybody who'd like to read? Okay. Um, so starting at verse 14, she took off the garments of her widowhood and covered herself with her veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gate of Anayim, which is by the way of Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up and she was not given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought that she was a prostitute for she had covered her face. He turned to her by the way and said, please come, let me come into you for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that you may come into me? He said, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She said, will you give me a pledge until you send it? He said, what pledge will I give you? She said, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. He gave them to her and came into her and she conceived by him. She arose and went away and put off her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, but he did not find her. So in verse 14, we read that Tamar veils herself and she sits in the gates at the entrance of Anayim, literally the Fetach Anayim at the opening of the eyes or at a crossroads. Chazal say, um, in Gemara Sota, that Tamar sat at the door at the petach of Avraham Avinu's residence to which all eyes, Anayim, looked forward to pay a visit. I'm going to um, just take you to that source, which is source number 13. So this is the Gemara Sota. The verse states with regard to Tamar, and she put off from her the garments of her widowhood and covered herself with her veil and wrapped herself and sat in the entrance of Anayim, the Fetach Anayim, which is by the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up and she was not given unto him to wife. The Amorayim dispute the meaning of the word Anayim. Rabbi Alexandri says, this teaches that she went and she sat at the entrance of the home of Abraham, our forefather, a place that all eyes hoped to see it as she was certain that Judah would pass there. Rabbi Hanin says that Rav says it is a place called Anayim, and similarly the verse states in the list of cities in Eretz Yisroel in the portion of Judah, Tapuach and Enam. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani says she provided eyes, Anayim, for her statements. That is, with her words, she provided an opening, Petach, for Judah to solicit her. When Judah solicited her to engage in sexual intercourse with him, he first attempted to verify her status and said to her, are you perhaps a Gentile? She said to him, I am a convert. He asked, perhaps you are a married woman? She said to him, I am an unmarried woman. 
He asked, perhaps your father accepted betrothal for you and you were unaware of it. She said to him, I am an orphan. He asked, maybe you are impure. She said to him, I am pure. Um, so Tamar had seen that Shalal was grown and according to Rashi, okay. Tamar was anxious to have children from Yosha. He lived for his family, he lived for his friends, and he lived for you. Radio was his passion, not TV, not Hello. writing, and he did those things and he excelled at Hello. those things. But radio. Okay. He was very like and to many of us. Someone needs to mute their mic, please. They just mute the TV. They just mute the TV. Powerful and utterly unknown. He enjoyed life, he embraced life. And I guess that's the moral of the story, isn't it? What you make of your life. I'll turn without the TV, without bothering you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Okay. So, according to Rashi, Tamar was anxious to have children from Yehuda as an ancestor or some other way, and therefore she offered herself to him. In verse 14, in verse 15 from the Torah, we saw that Yehuda had seen her and thought that she was a harlot because she was sitting at the crossroads. Now, if we look now at source 14, which continues the Gemara Sota, um, it teaches that when Tamar went to live in her father's house, she always covered her face and she was known to be a modest person. Mm -hmm. The Gemara continues its discussion of the incident of Judah and Tamar. It is written, when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a prostitute, but she had covered her face. The Gemara asks, because she had covered her face, he thought her to be a prostitute. Prostitutes usually uncover their faces in order to attract men. Rabbi Elazar says, the verse means that Tamar covered her face in the home of her father-in-law, Judah. Therefore, he did not recognize her when her face was uncovered. As Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani says, that Rabbi Yonatan says, any daughter-in-law who was modest in the home of her father-in-law merits that kings and prophets emerge from her. From where do we derive this? From Tamar. Prophets emerged from her as it is written. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos. Kings emerged from her as seen from David. And Rabbi Levi says, this matter is a tradition that we receive from our ancestors. Amos, father of Isaiah and Amaziah, king of Judea were brothers. This indicates that Isaiah was also from the house of David and therefore a descendant of Tamar. So um, Yehuda never suspected his daughter-in-law of um, being the one who was sitting in the um, and the Petach Enayim because he'd never seen her with her face uncovered. And Yehuda has relations with Tamar and she conceives. According to Rashi, she conceived men who were similar to Yehuda, strong and righteous. Now, in verse 20 that we read earlier, we saw that Yehuda said he would send a young goat to redeem his pledges. So let's look now at source 15. This is from the Medrash Bereshit Rabbah. The Holy One, blessed is he, said to Yehuda, you deceived your father with a goat. I swear that Tamar will deceive you with a goat. Rashi, citing this medrash, says that just as Yehuda had deceived Yaakov of Vinu through a goat by dipping the blood of the goat, by dipping Yosef's coat into the blood of the goat, so too was Yehuda deceived through a goat. Now Judah learns that Tamar is pregnant and he directs that she be punished by being burned. And rather than accuse Yehuda of being the father of her child, Tamar instead sends him the pledges that he had given to her when they had relations, his signet ring, cords, and staff, and she tells him she is pregnant by the owner of these things. Rashi says that Tamar thought that if Yehuda acknowledged his role, then he should do it voluntarily, and if he wouldn't do it voluntarily, then let him burn her and not embarrass him in public. If we look at um, source number 16, again from Gemara Sota, the verse describes Tamar's court hearing. When she was brought forth, Mutset, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man whose these are, am I with child? The Gemara comments, it should have stated when she was Mitutset, 
The word mutzet all, also carries the implication of being found. What then is taught by the use of that term? Rabbi Elazar says, after her signs, which she was using to prove that she was impregnated by Judah were brought out, the evil angel Samael came and distanced them from each other in an attempt to prevent Judah's admission and Tamar's survival, which would enable the birth of King David. The angel Gabriel then came and moved the signs closer, to, uh, closer again. Therefore, the word mutzet is used as it alludes to the signs being found again. The Gemara comments, this is as it is written for the leader upon Yonadei Lam Rechokim, a psalm Mikhtam of David. Rabbi Yochanan says the verse means from the moment that her signs were distanced, Rechokim, she became like a mute dove, Yona Ilemet. And the phrase a psalm, Mikhtam of David, means the one from whom David emerged as he was modest, mach, and flawless tam with everyone. Alternatively, Mikhtam indicates that Makato, the place on his body that would have required wounding, Makah, was complete, Tama, i.e. that David was born circumcised. Alternatively, Mechtam indicates that just as in his youth, David made himself small in front of the one who was greater than him in order to learn Torah from that person. So too, when he became great and was crowned king, he still behaved in this manner so that his modesty, Mach, was complete Tom all of his life. The verse concerning Tamar then states, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man whose these are, am I with child? The Gemara comments, and let her say to him explicitly that she was impregnated by him. Rav Zutra Batuvia says that Rav says, and some say Rav Chuna Bar Bizna says, that Rabbi Shimon Hasida says, and some say that Rabbi Yochanan says in the name of Rabbi Shimon Ben Yochai, it is more amenable for a person to throw himself into a fiery furnace if faced with the choice of publicly embarrassing another or remaining silent, even if it leads to being burned and not humiliate another in public. From where do we derive this? From Tamar, as she was prepared to be burned if Judah did not confess, rather than humiliate him in public. The verse continues, and she said, discern please, hakerna, who are these, the signet and the cords and the staff? Rabbi Chama, son of Rabbi Hanina says, with the use of the word discern, Judah informed his father that Yosef was lost, and also with the use of the word discern, they informed Judah about the signs. The Gemara explains, with the word discern, he informed Yaakov, his father, when he brought him the coat of Yosef and said to his father, and they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their fathers and, this is, and said, this is what we have found now. Discern now, hakirna, whether it is your son's coat or not. With the word discern, they informed him. And she said, discern please, whose are these? It says, it states discern please, na. The word na is nothing other than a language of request. The Gemara explains, she said to him, I request of you, discern the image of your creator in every person and do not avert your eyes from me. The verse states, and Judah acknowledged them and said, she is more righteous than I for as much as I gave her not to Shalah, my son. This is the same as Rav Hanin Bar Business says that Rabbi Shimon Hasidah says, Yosef who sanctified the name of heaven in private by not committing adultery with the wife of Potiphar merited that one letter from the name of the Holy One, blessed be he, was added to his name as it is written, he appointed it in Yosef, be Hosef, for a testimony in his name when he went forth against the land of Egypt. In this verse, the name of Yosef is written with an additional letter, He, found in the ineffable name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He continues, Judah, who sanctified the name of heaven in public, merited that his entire name is called by the name of the Holy One, blessed be he. For all the letters of the ineffable name of, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu are included within the name of Judah with the addition of the letter Dalid. In other words, the Yud Ke Vav Ke. When he confessed and said, she is more righteous than I, a divine voice went forth and said, you saved Tamar and her two children in her womb from being burned by the fire. By your life, that is in your merit, I will save three of your children from the fire. And who are they? 
Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Judah said, she is more righteous than I, Mimeni. The word Mimeni can also be understood as from me, with Judah thereby admitting that he is the father. The Gemara asked, from where did he know that it was in fact from him that Tamar was pregnant? The Gemara answers, a divine force went forth and said, from me, these hidden matters emerged, and this woman will be the mother of royalty, which requires that Judah be the father. The same verse continues, and he knew her, um, again, no more, seemingly indicating that Judah did not engage in sexual intercourse with Tamar again. Shmuel, the elder, father-in-law of Rav Shmuel Bar-Ami, says in the name of Rav Shmuel Bar-Ami, the verse actually means that once he knew of her and her intentions were the sake of heaven, he did not desist from engaging in sexual intercourse with her again, as it is written here, below Yasaf od ledeata, and it is written there at the giving of the Torah, these words the Lord spoke unto all your assembly in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice, and it went on no more, below Yasaf, which is interpreted to mean a great voice that did not cease. So from this passage, Chazal derived the teaching that it's far better for a man to let himself be cast into a fiery furnace than to speak publicly and shame his fellow. Note also that Tamar sent the pledges to Judah and the words she used, Hakarna, were the same words that Judah had used when Yosef's coat was shown to Yaakov Avinu. When Judah acknowledged his pledges publicly, says the Gemara, and saved Tamar and her unborn twins from um, being burnt, he sanctified Hashem's name and was spiritually elevated. Now, um, Okay, what is the significance of Yehuda's actions? He hears Tamar. When she asks him if he recognized the pledges, he recognizes his words to his father. He's beginning to learn that we need to be responsible for another person. And by admitting his role, he is beginning the process of change that culminates in the story of Binyamin. My teacher, Naima, gave us Winston Churchill's quote, Failure is not fatal, it's the courage to continue that counts. Yehuda had been in total despair. He had left his family, married a woman who was possibly the daughter of a Canaanite. He had messed up. He learned, however, that he did not have to give up on himself, that he needed to try harder, and that if he can overcome his negative qualities, he can be a better person. In the story with Tamar, Yehuda acknowledges his personal responsibility publicly recognizes that Tamar was more righteous than he, accepts public shame, and works actively to present the death of Tamar and, and to save her children, rather than covering up his own role. At the start of this passage, the Torah tells us that Yehuda went down. Perhaps he needed to go down in order to be able to rise up, to learn to understand the anguish of his father, to develop empathy for the loss of a beloved child. By recognizing the pledged items and acknowledging his own role, he's beginning to learn right from wrong and to take public responsibility for his own actions. Also, he is learning the evil of deception. Source number 17 is by Professor Menachem Ben Yashar of Bar Ilan University. Um, and it's his view on the placement of the Yehudi Tamar story. Would anybody like to read? I'll read. Okay, please, number 17. The, the Parsha teaches that Yehuda assimilated into a foreign culture due to his marriage to an indigenous woman. Its second son from this woman did a dishonorable act, and from this he was dragged unintentionally to an act of incense, incest, and in the end he was forced to admit the legality of this act, which is considered in the house of Jacob to be an abomination of the Gentiles. This explains the placement of this tale within the Yosef narrative, namely the time had come to bring the house of Yaakov to the social isolation possible only with the enslavement of Egypt. Thank you. Welcome. So Professor um, Ben Yashar says, Yehuda actually assimilated into the foreign culture of his wife. And in the end, he was forced to acknowledge the legality of Tamar's actions, 
even though incest would be considered an abomination in his father's household. He says the Shvatim had to transform from a clan into a nation. When Yaakov and his family go down to Egypt to settle, they're forced into a ghetto and they have to erect a spiritual offense between themselves and the rest of Egyptian society with its multiple gods. This isolation was necessary to forge the various tribes into one nation. As an aside, the Nitziv, Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda Berlin Zatzal, Dean of the Velozhin Yeshiva, says that Hakadosh Baruch Hu's answer to assimilation is anti-Semitism. Oh my God. Because it pushes us away from the larger society. Note, however, that in Source 18, the Medras gives a different explanation for why the Tamar Yehuda story is here after the story of Mechira Yosef, the sale of Yosef. And if we look at 18, which is Bereshit Rabbah, the Medrash, it says, and why are these stories juxtaposed one to another? Rabbi Elazar says, in order to juxtapose going down to going down. Rabbi Yochanan says, to juxtapose, recognize to recognize. Um, so Yosef, having gone down to Egypt as a slave, and Yehuda, have, Yehuda having gone down away from his family to a foreign culture, as well as the two examples of discernment, that is the recognition of the bloody coat and that of the pledges. Now, if we look at um, source 19, which is Parshat Vayigash, this is the very famous, famous encounter between Yehuda and the Viceroy of Egypt. Um, right. Joseph is the Viceroy of Egypt, and he has contrived to have his brothers bring Binyamin, his only full brother, down to Egypt. And he's now framed him for the alleged theft of the goblet and said that he will keep Binyamin in Egypt with him. Of all the brothers, it is Yehuda, not Reuben the oldest, but Yehuda, who approaches Yosef to plead for Binyamin. Yehuda knows that he cannot prove Binyamin's in innocence because the cup was found in Binyamin's sack. He cannot use logic to prove Binyamin is not guilty either. Instead, he appeals to Yosef's merciful side, asking him to release Binyamin out of the goodness of his heart and he offers himself as a substitute slave. Yehuda's speech to Yosef is the longest monologue in Sefer Breshit. And you can, um, I'll just try to read this through quickly. And then Judah came near to him and said, oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears and do not let your anger burn against your servant for you are even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant saying, have you a father or a brother? We said to my Lord, we have a father, an old man, a child of his old age, a little one, Yeled Zekunim Katan, and his brother is dead and he alone is left of his mother and his father loves him. You said to your servants, bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. We said to my Lord, the boy Hanar cannot leave his father for if he should leave his father, his father or he would die. Ba'azavet aviv v'met. You said to your servants, unless your youngest brother, Hakaton, comes down with you, you will see my face no more. It happened when we came up to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. Our father said, go again, buy us a little food. We said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother, Hakaton, is with us, then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother, Hakaton, is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons and the one went out for me. And I said, surely he is torn in pieces and I have not seen him since. If you take this one also from me and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father and the boy, Hanar is not with us. Since his life is bound up in the boy's life, it will happen when he sees that the boy, Hanar is no more, that he will die. Your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became collateral for the boy, Hanar, to my father, saying, if I do not bring him to you, then I will bear the blame to my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant stay instead of the boy, Hanar, a bond servant to my Lord, and let the boy, Hanar, go up with his brothers. For how will I go up to my father if the boy, Hanar, is not with me? lest I see the evil that will come on my father. The Medrash says that Yehuda was expressing his hope that his words would penetrate 
into the viceroy's soul. And Rashi says that when he asked that Yosef's anger not burn against him, one can understand that Yehuda was speaking harshly. He tells the viceroy that he, that he is even like Pharaoh. That is, according to Rashi, if you detain Binyamin, you will be struck with le leprosy as was your ancestor Pharaoh for keeping Sarah Imenu overnight. Or you are as unreliable as Pharaoh in that like him, you make promises just to set eyes on Binyamin and you don't keep them. Yehuda says in verse 19, you asked us questions. That is from the beginning, you asked us lots of questions. And we said to my Lord, we answered you. We held nothing back, even though your questions were merely a pretext to act, to act against us. We told you, if you look in verse 22, um, that if the youngest son leaves his father, he, the, he would die. Usually that's translated as that Yaakov Avinu would die without Binyamin. But Rashi says it can be translated that if Binyamin leaves his father, he could die. That is, the Shvatim would be anxious lest Binyamin die on the journey, as did his mother, Rachel Imenu. Whereas in verse 31, it's very clear that, Binyam, that if Binyamin does not return, Yaakov Avinu will die. Yehuda tells Yosef in verse 32 that he is a surety, a collateral for the term for the return of Binyamin. And in verse 33, he says that he, Yehuda, should be allowed to remain in his place. Rashi says Yehuda was offering that he would be a better servant than Binyamin, superior in strength, whether for battle or for service. Now, note that Yehuda does not discuss the allegedly stolen goblet at all. His remarks are a total plea for mercy. The first three portraits paint a sad portrait of an old man who lost one son and dearly loves his youngest son, all that remains of his mother and her seed. In the next verses, we notice that certain words repeat themselves more than would usually occur. For example, the word of, father, is repeated in the text 14 times. References to their father, the elderly man described above, keep bringing that image of the old man, the old sad man to mind. Um, I bold faced the word father um, in this uh, source sheet just to show you the repetition. The word Evid, servant, is repeated 13 times, and it shows that Yehuda is abnegating himself, mm -hmm. putting himself down. Similarly, the word Adoni, Lord, is repeated seven times, mm -hmm. showing Yehuda's recognition of Yosef's higher standing and Yehuda's submissiveness. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, throughout this speech, Binyamin is described as a Na'ar, a young man, or a Katan, a youngster. But consider the following. Yosef was 17 years old at the time of the sale. 13 years passed before he became second in command in Egypt. So he was now 30 years old. Seven years of plenty preceded the famine. So he was 37 years old by the time the famine began. We don't know how long Yaakov Avino and his household survived when the famine struck. But the earliest they would have traveled to Egypt was in the first year of the famine but 37 years after the sale of Yosef. Binyamin had been born before Yosef was sold, and therefore he was at least 20 or 21, 21 years old by this time, probably older than that, maybe as old as 33 years himself. Mm -hmm. Moreover, as is present in Egypt, as he is present in Egypt, Yosef can see him and he can see how old he is for himself. Note that Moshe Rabbeinu was referred to as a Na'ar when he was placed into the basket and let loose on the Nile. So the word, so the word Na'ar can mean anything from baby to young man. By repeating the words Na'ar and Katan, Yehuda is emphasizing the youth and immaturity of Binyamin, his uselessness as a servant compared to himself. Based on a simple reading of the Tanakh, there was just a seven year age difference between Ruben and Yosef. During the second set of the seven years that Yaakov Avinu worked, he was already married to Rachel Amenu, which was given to us to Yosef, but not yet to Binyamin. All of the children of the Shvatim had been um, born. Robin, you need to move closer to your mic. We can't hear you. OK, can you hear me now? OK, all of the children of the Shvatim had been born before Binyamin. So what is the significance of this passage in Vayigash? 
Yehuda describes how much his father dotes on Benyamin. He expresses empathy for his father. Yosef tested his brothers to see how they would treat Benyamin. Would they blame him for the alleged theft? Would they sell him or desert him? Would they hate him or would they protect him? Yehuda's remarks to Yosef showed that he had taken responsibility for his father's life and for his brother's life. He appreciates what the impact of the loss of Benyamin would mean to Yaakov, the inconsolable grief he would experience. Yehuda is willing to nullify himself and offer himself as a slave instead of Benyamin to spare his father that indescribable grief and pain. Um, I wanted to share with you two variant midrashim as to Yehuda's speech to Yosef. If we look at source 20, which is um, a medrash, midrashic read of Yehuda's oration. Fran, would you like to read um, the first one? There's, there's two of them. So this is the first one that I have on the screen. And Yehuda approached. Right. Okay. A uh, Madrashic read of Yehuda's oration. And Yehuda approached. He approached with accusations. For you are like Pharaoh. Just as Pharaoh, your master, loves women and covets them, so too you saw Benjamin, who was very handsome and desired him as a slave. You came to us with a plot, intending to frame us. Many come to Egypt to buy food, but you asked only us about our family and you did not ask them. Yosef, why are you the spokesman from all your brothers? I saw in my goblet that among your brothers there are those who are greater than you. Yehuda, what you saw is only because I took responsibility for my brother. Yosef, so why did you not take responsibility for your brother when you sold him to Egypt? You told your father he was torn by a wild animal and he not and he not sinned to you? Yeah, sorry. This, this one who sinned, go and tell your father. After the bucket goes the rope. When Yehuda heard this, he began to cry and scream. But how can I go up to my father without my brother? Yehuda immediately told Naphtali, go see how many markets there are in Egypt. He reported 12. Yehuda said, I will destroy three. You each take one of the others and we oh will God. not... We will not, not leave Ney behind. His brothers told him, but Egypt is not like Shem. If you destroy it, you will destroy the world. Go and, on. This, um, and now this is the, the variation of the same Medrash. Go ahead. Yehuda, from the very beginning, you came to us with plots and schemes. You told us we are spies, that we came to uncover the secrets of the land, that we stole, I swear, that I will take out my sword and destroy Egypt. Yosef, but if you take out your sword, I will wrap it around your neck. Oh my God. Yehuda, you are falsely accusing us. Yosef, there is no false justice that compares to selling your brother. The <laughs> fire of Shem is within me. Yosef, it is the fire of your daughter-in-law Tamar and I shall douse it. Yehuda, now go die all the marketplaces in Egypt in blood. Yosef, you were dyers beforehand when you dyed your brother's cloak and blood and you said that he is torn to pieces. And when Yosef saw that they were of a mind to destroy Egypt, he said to himself, better that I make myself known to them and they not destroy Egypt. So the Midrashim give you a flavor of um, how um, the clash of wills between Yehuda, the ancestor of Mashiach ben David and Yosef the answer of Mashiach ben um, Yosef, you get a sense of this clash of wills between them. The Mashiach ben Yosef is mentioned in the Gemara and by some sages and is said to be the one who will lead the Jews back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's good graces, unite the Jews in exile and lead them in the final battle of Gog and Magog leading to the redemption. Both the Abarvanel and Malbim treat his existence as a Kabbalah a tradition known to Chazal from the prophets themselves. So, when one considers leadership, what are the qualities we seek in a leader? We don't want a Reuben who's wishy-washy and cannot make a decision or is flummoxed when things don't go as planned. We don't want a Shimon or Levi who are hotheads and will act too quickly without regard to the consequences. We want someone who can act 
but we also want someone who is wise and acts appropriately. We want someone who understands the risks being taken and the toll these risks may impose on others, especially those under his command. We want someone who can, who can acknowledge his mistakes, control his impulses, repent of and regret his mistake and learn from them. Someone who can, com who can compromise and negotiate when necessary. In short, we want a Yehuda. And this is why he, of all the Shvatim, was Zohar to have his descendants become the kings of Israel, just as Yaakov Avinu blessed and foresaw. So um, next week, I will be talking about Sha'ul HaMelech. Um, if I wasn't one week behind, then the discussion tonight would have um, encapsulated what was covered in the Haftorah yes, uh, um, today's Sunday, yesterday on um, during Shabbat. But does anybody have any questions about Yehuda? No, okay. So thank you all so much. Um, as I mentioned, next week, God willing, we'll be talking about Shaul HaMelech, what his strengths and weaknesses were and why the um, Malchus was taken away from him. So everybody have a good week, stay safe and um, be well. Thanks thank very you. much for a great presentation. Thank this you. is why I'm, uh, I'm Binder. Thank you so much for participating. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Robin. Great job. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.